Hi everyone, welcome back to another Talk HR UK podcast. My name again is Damien Barnard, I'll be your host today. Um, before we delve into what we're going to be discussing in my guest today, I've got a, a little bit of competition with Simon. So for some of our viewers that saw the YouTube video of Simon's podcast with Dave Hodges, who is the head of HR at Talis. Simon wore a Christmas hat. I unfortunately do not have a Christmas hat and this will be landing in January. So I've gone for as loud as possible. So let us know um, who wins on that one. But more importantly, I'm really excited about this particular podcast because really trying to drive away from talking about the pandemic and COVID and how businesses have reacted. And I've, I've identified somebody who works for a business that we know incredibly well. We're fortunate enough to have Paula Leach, who is the Chief People Officer at FDM uh, currently. Um, she is hugely passionate about leadership. And we are going to be talking a lot around leadership qualities, positive traits, negative influences, and what we can try and do from an organization and human perspective on that aspect. Um, Paula, if you don't mind for the benefit of our listeners, do you mind just giving us a bit of an introduction? Because your whole career is really interesting and now you're at a bit of a crossroads, aren't you? Yep, yep, some things changing so I can share that. Thank you very much and it's great to be here um, and have the conversation today. I'm looking forward to it. So um, from my perspective, I've been in the people business for just over 25 years. Um, I did a business degree, came out of university and started a career with Ford Motor Company and had a wonderful career um, across that organization, working um, from manufacturing sites all the way to through to head office. I worked in the UK, I worked across Europe and had the opportunity to live and work in the States as well. Um, so saw that automotive business from right from the grassroots where we were producing the vehicles all the way through um, to working with the top executives in the organization on succession and talent and team working and leadership. So I had a wonderful 18 years actually with Ford Motor Company. Um, and at the end of 2013, I moved on from there uh, and I had the opportunity to then move into the civil service, um, which wasn't something that was in my career plan, but I'm hugely grateful for the opportunity. I moved into the home office um, which, I mean, everyone will be familiar, obviously with Ford Motor Company will be familiar with the home office. The home office is just for um, an idea of scale. And this is about 30,000 people that work for, for the home office at that time. But the system that we support is much, much bigger when you start to get, um, you know, into the, the way that that works. It's a very systemic organization. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to be chief people officer at the home office. Uh, I was very privileged to have that position. Um, and worked with some incredible um, public servants during that time. And I sat on the executive committee there as well. And we designed and um, were in the process of delivering sort of two people strategies. So I did an initial people strategy there and then built another people strategy out as well. Um, and I was there for about four and a half years in total. Um, and at that point, um, I moved on to FDM Group, which you've mentioned. So FDM Group, um, yep, yeah, we're a sort of talent pipeline business. We take um, graduates, um, ex-military and returners to work, and they come through our training programs, predominantly in technology. Um, and then, you know, we have the opportunity to network them into some fantastic businesses. So I'm passionate about diversity and inclusion, very passionate about it. I'm hugely passionate about the STEM agenda mm -hmm. and the fact that we need more people with STEM skills to be able to meet the demand that we have in, in, you know, in businesses and in organizations. Um, so I've been really privileged to work in this organization and help to bring about some transformation and change mm -hmm. um, as it continues to grow and scale around the world. Um, and as you say, yep, so I've brought around a big change program there that they're taking forwards. And for me, um, I'm moving forwards in 2021. Uh, so January 2021, uh, I will be setting up my own business. Uh, so working independently um, and I'm going to be focusing on executive coaching, uh, business advisory services all around the people agenda. Um, I'm setting up a charitable foundation to support young women that is aligned to that business right from the start. 
Um, and I have a book coming out in February, which is all about leadership, which we're going to talk about today. So uh, that book's called Vantage Points, and hopefully we'll share some today. Your plate is full, isn't it? It's, <laughs> been an, it's been an intense year, and you've got a lot more pipeline, which is amazing. Um, we're definitely going to delve into the leadership piece, but what I wanted to just bring a connection to, because we kind of spoke about this um, in our pre-build, our pre-plan uh, ahead of this podcast was leadership and people. They're the same in the private sector as they are in the public sector. And, you know, that actually was a really interesting cultural uh, sort of comparison. Whereas quite often, certainly from a recruiter perspective, when we're supporting hiring, it's quite often private sector one, private sector. Oh, we want listed, we want blue chip or public sector goes, we need somebody else from, another public sector because they'll understand our culture but actually when we talk about leadership and challenging the status quo so hopefully that's what we can get into today um, yeah. so let's just define leadership in in your sort of experience and expertise what exactly is leadership because i guess there's a difference between management and behaviors versus leadership yeah so i'll probably i'll probably sort of share my view on that from two perspectives so first of all if somebody is in a leadership position, essentially the, the job that that leader has is to move something from A to B. They are responsible for sort of curating and coordinating a shared endeavor, usually of people, sometimes of people and resources, to move something from A to B. And that can be, you know, leadership exists in any context. It could be a huge transformation. It could be tens of thousands of people that you are, you know, coordinating and trying to lead to move something from A to B. It could be the day-to-day -day operations of something reasonably quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. It could be reasonably transactional, but you are still leading that. So you are responsible as a leader to move something from A to B. So that's the first sort of perspective that I think is useful to have. Because sometimes I think we can think of leadership and just sort of almost view it as a day-to-day -day activity or an extension of a, um, you know, a, a particular activity we've done as an individual contributor. And it's not, it's actually about that shared endeavor and supporting that. So in supporting that movement from A to B, I just think there's two fundamental jobs that a leader has to do. One is to create clarity and the other one is to get out of the way and create space mm -hmm. for people to fill. And those two things are symbiotic. If you do too much of one, it can be an issue. If you do too much of another, it can be an issue. It's about balancing constantly. Are things clear? Do people understand? Do I understand? Do we all understand where we're going, how we're going, what's happening? And, and you can bring people along on that journey, That's that you can do that together. Um, and secondly, um, how do I create the space for everybody to bring their skills, talents, ideas, capabilities, their agency towards that endeavor. So it's those two things that a leader is responsible for. So to me, that's leadership. I think that's a really nice way to surmise it. I, as soon as you said that, I, I mean, I went straight to sort of the top of the tree and I'm imagining a business typically led by say a managing director. And it, and I just played on the words of, managing director and I typically thought of manager again you know that sort of skill set but you know you do start trying to think differently and I'm sure many many MDs CEOs they've already grasped because they're in that position at that level the difference between management and leadership but it's funny how we've associated managing director the person that leads the business with that job title you know I guess that's just a bit of legacy Let's talk about common mistakes. Where do leaders go wrong and how can we, how can we ensure that doesn't happen moving forward? Well, I think, leader, the first thing I should say is I, I think in all of my experience working with leaders across all different sectors and all different contexts and being a leader myself as well, I mean, it's actually really quite hard and I think, you know, I acknowledge that right from the start because I think um, leading, leading people to be inspired 
to be their best to everybody's different viewpoints, managing all the emotions that happen because we're human, um, managing your own emotions, um, dealing with problems, trying to create space. I mean, it, all of it is very, very difficult. So I think, you know, as, as, a, as a starting point, um, is there anything that exists? Is there anyone that exists that is the perfect leader? I mean, no, <laughs> and that's okay. I, I think we can, we can expect a lot of our leaders. Mm. And I do often talk um, to people within organizations that I work with, that you know, when they are challenged by something that a leader has done, hasn't done, you know, whatever, just try and approach that with some degree of compassion because this is difficult and stand in their shoes and try and help as well. So that kind of two way piece about it, I don't think the responsibility of effective leadership always has to land on the shoulders of the leader on their own um, is the sort of first thing I would, I would say on that. But in terms of, of, of pitfalls, um, I think if you enter leadership um, without understanding that it's not really about you, I think that's quite a challenge. And it's interesting. I mean, you, you're obviously in the, in the business of um, helping leaders to grow and move into different mm -hmm. positions and take on more responsibilities. In my experience interviewing people over the years, often when you say to people, why do you want this position? Why do you want to move into leadership? Often people will say, oh, well, you know, I'm ready for a step up. Mm -hmm. um, or they might say, oh, well, I've been doing it anyway. So, you know, I've, I've been stepping in, I've been stepping up, you know, both of those answers are about that person. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact, the very best leaders have reached a point with themselves where the leadership is actually about the mission. It's about the thing that we're trying to get done. That's bigger than them themselves. Yeah. And it's such a great thing because it takes the pressure off you as well, mm -hmm. trying to sort of step into being in charge you don't have to be in charge that isn't really the same as leadership for me leadership is about asking great questions it isn't about having all the answers all of the time um, leadership is about ensuring that we've got shared expectations and understanding leadership is some i mean sometimes yes you have to be um decisive and you have to move forwards with things and it's not always about a coaching style um, but overall, I think when the biggest pitfall is when you think that it's that this is about you and you have to occupy a certain space. And then linked with that would be really about awareness and emotions. And, and, I, and I say that from the perspective of we're all emotional. We all feel emotions. And that's good. I'm not saying that people shouldn't feel emotions. But I think where a leader isn't aware of how they're feeling and therefore how that might impact other people is one of the biggest challenges I've certainly coached people around and worked with people on over many, many years is raising that degree of, of self-awareness. Don't act too quickly. Create a moment of choice so that you know what you're doing is intentional and helpful to everybody. I want to go back to what you just said regarding uh, individuals that maybe you've met or hired or interviewed um, who have said, it's the next step for me. It's, I've been doing something very similar for a while. I'm ready to take on the reins or the responsibility. And I think that is so true. I mean, as a recruiter, I hear that day in, day out. Everybody wants the next step, but actually you're you're so right. It is the person that will go and say, I know your end goal is to get from here to there as a business. And I want to support that journey. And this is the skills I can bring to this leadership role. And I want to be a part of that success story. I want to, and then you're right. It's, I'm, I'm already imagining that horse and car type mindset or you know, the, the leader that's dragging the train that's full of all his passengers, as opposed to everybody pulling the same train in that direction. It, you make your you make your business decision so much easier and it makes the goal so much more realistic when everybody is fighting and we all know that analogy we know that but when we talk about a management role or a leadership role i don't think that's our default way of thinking i think we're human nature and we think climbing the ladder 
is is normal and is expected. And I wanted to ask you actually, from a tenure perspective, sometimes it's a given that somebody gets a leadership role because they've been there for a while or they've done that for a while within the business. Is that something you've seen in the past without, of course, naming names? Is that typical traits of, of businesses? Yeah, I think that question that you're asking and then even your, your prior comments sort of um, make, me, make me think quite a lot about organisational design mm. and some of the things that I'm really interested in helping and supporting businesses with really in terms of... Um, in terms of how to design organizations for everybody, because not everybody is a leader and not everybody wants to take on those broader aspects of leadership responsibility. But lots of people would like progression, status, more money, you know, all of those things that mean that we are moving forwards. And interestingly, in our, in a lot of organizational structures, it's two dimensional. So you come in, there's a job discipline, you know, whether you're in sales or marketing or finance or whatever function you're in um, and you, or operations. And then you move up the organization into hierarchical positions, which inevitably at some point will involve you managing people mm -hmm. and managing more resources. And interestingly, there's a really interesting diagram that says the, the more senior that you get in an organization, the less time you do the thing that you started out doing, whether that's your technical specialism or whatever, and the more time you will spend on people and money. And, you know, that, that's absolutely true in my experience, that the more senior you get, the more you are working around the people agenda, working around the finance agenda, and you're solving problems, and the less time you're doing perhaps the technical area of interest that perhaps might interest you. And I'm interested in organizations pushing this a little bit with their structures to create three dimensional structures. And we've actually been doing this in, in my organization um, with the creation of more of a three dimensional structure, um, which is really around, it's very important for the individual and the organization to understand that job of leadership I described at the beginning. Otherwise you end up with people that either through tenure, you're right, or through being very good in their technical discipline, find themselves in leadership and managerial roles, almost by accident. And I call this accidental leadership. And it's no issue because I think it's just so much expected. And I'd like to encourage both individuals to think really deeply, do I want to wake up in the morning and do that leadership job? Really? Or is it actually the the status or the responsibility or the money or the something else that I'm interested in growing. And the more organizations are able to create this third dimension, this depth opportunity for individuals to progress in their technical discipline without necessarily taking on managerial or hierarchical responsibility. I think that's really, really important because actually organizations want those people to do the stuff they're really good at and they love and often taking on a leadership and managerial role can take you away from those things if if that's what you love and i'm there's a pivotal point in people's careers and sometimes it might be around that sort of five year mark where you make this choice between hierarchical leadership or the alternative often is nothing it isn't progression it isn't that um, but in actual fact, organizations do need people with that deeper experience, just focusing on bringing that capability to the organization. So it would be great if tenure had another place to go yeah. and not just about leadership, because I think that would be more satisfying for some people. Mm -hmm. And I think for businesses, it would avoid the situation where you've got people in leadership positions who don't enjoy the people side of it, et cetera, so they don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, or they're very unaware of that side of the leadership job, or they're doing it off the side of their desk whilst really they're doing the stuff that they love. But they should be creating the space for someone else to do that. So I think the solution lies in organisational design and being more creative about how we find career routes for everybody 
that don't always involve progression through leadership so that the people that do progress through leadership do so intentionally. Definitely. And I think that will definitely improve in the years to come. I was anticipate it is just, it's almost a given through a generation that that's just what we have to do. And we've all seen that people have put their hands up saying, I want to step into management and step into leadership. And actually very quickly they've gone, this is maybe a little too big for me or this is a little too much for me. I'm, I'm not enjoying it. And, and you're right. We do that sort of soul searching exercise. Um, okay. So that's, that's really interesting. Do you think that there is like, can you spot a natural leader straight away and is it intuitive or is it something you can learn? I think it's both actually in my experience. So I think there are, I think there are some people for whom it, it's like anything, any skill, any capability, anything we do in our lives. Some people have, through nature and nurture or one or the other or both probably um, are more likely to have an interest in other people, are more likely to ask questions, are more likely to feel comfortable with themselves and therefore able to put themselves forward are more likely to um, be able to formulate strategy and articulate it or speak and communicate in a way which is inspiring to people. So I think there are some people who will just by nature or nurture have more of that capability around them. Um, is it impossible for people to develop those leadership capabilities? Absolutely not. Um, I've, I've seen growth in so many people um, uh, and it does take time and you do need to build and it is I, I always think of leadership as a practice mm -hmm. so it's one of those things that you just have to be constantly curious about what's happening how are people experiencing me what was effective what could I do better and no one has arrived there is no one not a CEO in the world or a chair in the world that has arrived in terms of leadership everybody needs to be constantly thinking about oh you know, I'm curious about how impactful I'm able to be because that impact is the thing that's moving stuff from A to B and sustaining it. So I think it is an absolute mix. I do think that there's an organisational responsibility for individuals, you know, to support individuals in their leadership journey. I think there's an individual responsibility for it. I mean, even if I take my own example, there've been moments where I've had brilliant opportunities through organisations I've worked with to develop myself mm. and there have been moments where I've funded and paid for that myself because I think it's part of my ongoing responsibility and journey to do so and then the final thing I would say on developing as a leader is leader there is no getting away from the fact that leadership is personal mm. and increasingly so if you think about the way that AI is changing and technology is changing the way the, the work that is around leadership is so much less about managing and leading tasks and it is much more now about, about leading collaboration and leading creativity and leading human engagement and the interface between human and machines so the the there's even more requirement for people to consider this as a very much a personal thing and that requires you to know yourself quite deeply and face up to our shadow sides as well as our positive sides and be at ease with that and that is personal work and personal journey work and any leader who doesn't feel that there is some personal work to do I think is, is in danger of missing the ability to be aware of themselves and therefore their impact on other people which is fundamentally the tool that they have. I mean, what you have as a leader is yourself. Yeah. Uh, let's challenge that thought for a second. And I said I wanted to avoid talking about COVID and the pandemic, but let's just talk about remote working at the moment. Mm. And it's it's very likely it's going to stick around, whether it's two days, three days, all or nothing. We don't know yet. But from a leadership perspective, you just spoke about that human engagement. Surely there's a risk, potentially, for leaders not to be able to converse more freely, more frequently, to really understand their team strengths and weaknesses, to create the space. 
because of course we're all working from home we're having less interaction so is there a danger that we could from a leadership perspective get it wrong with remote working i think there is but i probably would take i mean there's no doubt about it we're human beings social you know you, you just look at maslow's hierarchy of needs or any other model you know social connection is right there and many people would argue it's actually the foundation of um you know people's well-being um actually so there's no getting away from it this fully remote situation is challenging and hopefully short term um but i do think, think it's really enabled us to think a bit differently about the future and what that might be and challenging why we do things the way we do and whether or not there is another way that is you know supportive of everybody so i think and i think we've been in each other's homes and lives actually in some more intimate ways than we ever have so on the one hand remote working means you can't have that water cooler moment you don't bump into somebody you know those chance encounters it has to be a bit more scheduled um and it and it can feel a little bit less personal on the other side we've seen people's pets their children their washing in the background the doorbell ringing um <laughs> you know we've, we've entered into people's personal lives and realized we're all human beings with the same stuff going on that's brought us closer together so i, I think there's there's a balance that we've experienced in terms of leadership and remote working well, i've been an advocate for us trying things out in this space for years because i've worked very flexibly for many years mm. um and i think the concept of whether you're remote or not is sort of almost the red herring in the conversation because if anyone's worked in global teams you know we've actually been doing this for years um it's more about intention it's more about rather than having a chance meeting with somebody let me think about my responsibility to create connection check in with somebody have a conversation with them and maybe i did have that chance meeting with somebody when i was making a cup of tea in the office but what about all the other people that i didn't meet when i was having a cup of tea in the office but perhaps i should be connecting with and Finding, I think it almost creates a bit more of a level playing field. And I think for leaders, you know, part of your job is creating space for connection and discussion and energy to transfer between people and listening. And maybe it forces a, um, a better practice in ourselves. So I'm, it's been interesting. I've been around this conversation this year and I've looked at a lot of stuff that people are writing about this with, and I've been observing it with real interest and this whole idea that um, we've had something taken away from us and therefore, you know, remote working is difficult. Well, it, it can be if you don't participate. Mm. But one of your jobs as a leader is to participate and oh my goodness hasn't technology chat saved us in yeah. 2020 and you just have to be willing to try some new stuff and do some new stuff and be a bit more intentional i would we all prefer to have a hybrid mix and a bit of everything of course i think people would and that will yeah. happen yeah. um but right now um i think rather than feeling oh you know I, I can't just do this i can't just do that we are where we are mm -hmm. so we just need to get more intentional about it and drop that little team's note to somebody and organize a little coffee drop in on a team meeting like you might in the office and just say hi all of those things that we know make a difference and help people to smile and feel heard and I think it also goes back to what you were suggesting earlier is if there's a leader listening to this and is worried about you know that element and aspect well actually is creating space and you might lose a little bit of momentum on one area but gain in another if you get somebody in your team that just flourishes picks something up and just does it off their own accord well 
you might be that much closer to your end goal. Um, you've been really polite and modest, and I obviously know this about you, but you haven't mentioned your book yet that's going to be coming out soon um, and got into a lot of detail. So clearly, I guess for any leaders that just wants to enhance their skills, get a better sense of perspective on it, they need to get your book. So like, when are you releasing this? What led you to actually writing a book? Because it's not often people publish books. Yeah, thank you. I've loved writing this. This book's been in the making, um, well, for, th for three years, really. So it wasn't um, overnight then, it's been a not, long... <laughs> <laughs> not overnight at all. Three years, really, I've been like, right, I'm going to write this book. And then I just told so many people I just had to do it in the end. I think that's, that, that's the thing. If you've got an idea and a passion and you want to do something, just tell everybody. Myth. And eventually someone will go, have you actually written it yet? So, <laughs> uh, But it's 25 years. It's the whole of my career, really, in in consideration because um, I feel passionately as you hopefully has come across through the discussion that you know good leadership is absolutely crucial for us all it's the fundamental of everything it's the fundamental of people's well-being it's the fundamental of business performance it's the fundamental of you know societal well-being I mean gosh you know one in four is the statistic isn't it of people who suffer with a mental health issue Work may or may not be the cause of it. Sometimes it is. Um, but it certainly can either make it better or make it worse, depending on the experience. We all have a responsibility to recognise the privilege and the responsibility that a leadership position holds. So given that, the whole point of the book is it's completely pragmatic. It's not a research book. <laughs> it's not an academic book. It's based on my experience of watching leaders, being a leader, and very, very practically, you know, that it is a focus on that creating clarity and getting out of the way. And there is a, you know, and the way in which leaders can do that is by accessing five different vantage points. So the book is called Vantage Points. It's published in February. Um, I think that it's gone to print literally this week. So hopefully, uh, if, if you follow me on LinkedIn, um, you'll start to see some things coming, coming up on there around it. And it's being published by Lid, who are a great partner in this. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll be bringing it out. It's not a long book. It's a very focused, practical book. It talks about how you can create clarity, how you can get out of the way. And then there's some coaching tips in the back as well, which I've used with leaders um, and I use on myself lots of different practical toolkits about things that you can do to create that sense of intention as a leader uh, and there's a lovely little troubleshooting section at the end as well which is a bit fun so um i i hope it's an easily accessible book and yeah something for leaders everywhere whether you're just starting out on your journey um or you are wanting to reflect as a more experienced leader on Am I waking up every day and fulfilling my potential as a leader, but also what other people need from me? Um, so yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to write it, and I'm really looking forward to talking more about it in the coming months. No, absolutely, and you should be incredibly proud to be able to, you know, fulfil something that clearly is a long ambition of yours, three years in the making, and you are definitely so passionate about the subject and. You know, I feel like we're only touching the surface and unfortunately we are going to be soon to, to wrap up on this one. So we might have to pick it back up in the new year. But I think the layers in leadership, anybody listening to this is either reflecting on are their bosses good leaders? If they're in a management or leadership role themselves, are they good leaders? And business leaders themselves need to do that sort of self-awareness and and, and measure themselves and hopefully if there's any listeners there that have enjoyed listening to to us and to you more particularly um, go and have a look at the book it's a great exercise and um, to get extra insights and, like you say to develop us further but Paula thank you so much for your time today it's been really good to, to have you as part of the uh, podcast you're very welcome I've really really enjoyed it and it's an important subject and it's good to have a, a, a conversation about it thank you you're more than welcome. All the best and we'll certainly catch up soon.